So today I want to show you what we're doing at Mammoth and then create some interest in the company and as we're also partnering and we're looking for technologies and to give you an overview here. So we have two North Stars um, at Mammoth and I think that's kind of the speciality of the company that we're working in both therapeutics and diagnostics. All of this is based on CRISPR technology. And I will show you what kind of the differences are for the CRISPR technology that we're using. On one hand, we're looking, and I will not talk about this today here much, but the diagnostics using the CRISPR technology with the end goal to having this decentralized device where you can quickly test very fast with PCR accuracy um, any disease in the future. You can multiplex, so think about a panel testing, but also higher throughput testing, what we're working on right now. Um, and as you can imagine, this has received a lot of increase um, <clears throat> in importance during the pandemic, and, and we are working also on the COVID test for sure. On the other hand, therapeutics, CRISPR technology has been proven now in the clinic, some very good first results, still a lot of um, things to do. But we're working here on permanent cures, and I hope I will be able to show you that with our systems, we believe we have a very good opportunity to address a lot of in vivo indications because of the characteristics of the systems. So the, the kind of like toolbox that we create at MAMIS consists of several CRISPR systems. And just to mention a few here of CAS14 and cas you might have heard of about. Um, very interesting systems because they are extremely small. And I will show you some more properties here. And they can be used for diagnostics. So if I would go back to that, you cannot use Cas9, for example, for the diagnostic use of CRISPR because you need different activity of the systems. And so that's when the team worked at UC Berkeley to discover other systems. And then these can also be used for therapeutics. And we license those in exclusively and, and building our IP portfolio. The team is growing. <clears throat> As I mentioned, I joined in November 2019. And we were about 20 people at that time. Now we are 115 people. And you see the leadership team is building out. The company was founded out of Jennifer Doudna's lab. So she's a co-founder, together with Janice Chen and Lucas Harrington, who worked on several of the discoveries in her group, the, the CRISPR use of um, the, the diagnostic use of CRISPR, but also these novel systems like Cas14, Casx, and others. And we brought in this expertise and the know-how, how to discover these systems and how to work with them into the company. And then we are adding complementary functions. Just recently, we announced Gary Loeb joined from Sangamo as general counsel. So bringing in really expertise that we can also execute on these, right? Because you will see there's more companies that are discovering novel CRISPR systems. And in the end, you have to differentiate by really moving these towards the patients. <clears throat> and then the next level leadership team you see also um, from very interesting companies like um, Abbott, Diagnostics for sure, Cephite, and so on. And we're building this team out further. Recently, we announced funding. So we announced the Series CD funding combined. Um, of 195 million, and overall we have raised 255 million. And you see it's a very interesting group of investors. Initially, when the company was focused on diagnostics, more like tech-focused investors, and you see here Mayfield, NFX, Amazon, Verily, <clears throat> and now we're adding more and more therapeutics-focused investors like Red Mile, who led the recent round in Foresight and others. So the potential, how we see the CRISPR system is really as an, a reading system. So you try to identify a specific sequence in DNA or RNA, and then some action can happen. So this can be detection, for example, so that's the reading part, if you will. So you're really looking for a very specific, and this is an example here, COVID-19 sequence, which could be even a subtype of COVID. And only if you identify that, you get a signal. It can be writing, and that's more the traditional, if we can call that after 10 years, traditional CRISPR technology, knockout, modulation. So we also look in CRISPR-I, CRISPR-A, base editing, and so on, all these kind of technologies. And how do we discover our novel systems? We really put a lot of effort into building a very good database, metagenomic database. And I think what differentiates 
us from several other companies, not the size, I mean, everybody will claim they have a very large database, but it's also the diversity. Because coming from the diagnostics, as you can imagine, you have completely different requirements for these CRISPR systems. You need, require a heating step, for example. So that means you need CRISPR systems that are active at higher temperatures, like 65 degrees Celsius. Cas9 would not even survive that. So now you discover systems, <clears throat> and that's why we went very diverse with the samples that go into the database. For example, systems from volcanoes. We have samples from Antarctica, from the Mariana Trench, from lakes, from rivers, from human, from animals, and so on. So it's extremely diverse. Think about pH value differences and, and so on. So that's what we're building. And then we have the ability and the rights to use these in all these areas that are listed here. And the company is focusing really on diagnostics and therapeutics. IP is very important, as you know. I mean, that's where we really differentiate, I think, from the Cas9 companies. You all know about this dispute. Um, these systems are completely independent of Cas9, and we also believe that we have a very strong IP position for these systems in itself. Um, you see here the numbers of patents that we have, and those cover the foundational IP of Cas14 and the Cas fees. And one example key claim I want to um, highlight here, for example, is the CAS systems with a rough C domain of less than 900 amino acids. So what we're trying here to cover really and adding more and more examples of these extremely small CRISPR systems covering the whole field. This is how we move into the therapeutics. And as you can imagine, you start um, in vitro and then you move into cell lines. So we're validating these systems further and further. And right now, <clears throat> we're working in in vivo animal models. And hopefully, very soon, we will be able to present you some data here. So why are these systems different? And, and here, it's, it's a kind of representation at scale, um, cas phi versus Cas9. And you see that's already much smaller, so the size but also the PEM sequence that is required for a CAS system to, to create an action when identifying DNA or RNA sequence, um, that is very restricted for the original CAS9 systems, like SP-CAS9, SA-CAS9. And these systems that we have access to and identified and add, adding um, to our database, they have much less restricted PEM sequences. So you can imagine the targeting range being much larger the fidelity of these type 5 systems is in general higher. You have also seen that maybe for Cas12a. Um, editors has reported on that um, heavily. So more selective than Cas9 as well, less off target. And then the IP situation that I mentioned earlier. And here to give you an insight into the size, the systems we are working with, on the lower part of this slide, you see Cas12a, Cas9 listed, extremely large proteins actually. Now, on the top in green, you see the CRISPR systems like cas 700 to 800 amino acids, so roughly half maybe. But then the Cas14s go down now to 400 and even less amino acids. So extremely small systems, one third of the size. And how could we kind of like take advantage of that? And you clearly see delivery is one of the areas where companies are still struggling. And here, as an example, an AV delivery, if you would take SP-Cas9, which is 1,386 amino acids, that's actually too large for an AV. You also need to add the guide RNAs, right, and so on. So it's too much payload. And so if you would use a Cas14 system, you see here you have a lot of space. And that's not only for, in general, to deliver it, but also for additional components, guide RNAs, but also for different modalities. If you think about base editing, right now, if you want to deliver a base editor that is bu um, built on Cas9 or Cas12a, you have to split it into two AVs. Both AVs have to go into one cell and then recombine. Here, you could do all in one, right? And that's a huge advantage for sure. Now, this is not only limited to AV. As you know, AVs have a very restricted payload restriction. But for lipid nanoparticles, you can also imagine that smaller systems add much more stability because, I mean, I always explain this to investors. 
that when you have a recycling box and you have your boxes that you have to put in, the papers, right, you cut them into smaller pieces, right, to just fill much more in and it becomes much more stable packaging. And that's the same for lipids, where you can have much more in there, much smaller particles, and the lipids become more stable, and with that, the cell penetration is better, and you get an increased efficiency for that as well. Plus, you can deliver much more payload, right? I mean, you can three times the amount of CRISPR system into one cell. I mentioned the PEM sequence already, and you see here just representative um, Cas12a, if you look at that PEM sequence, how many sites in the human genome could you target, right? And this is going up if you get less restricted. On the right side, the green ones, these are just examples out of our toolbox of the mammoth systems, and you just can see that you have a much increased targeting range. So that's very important if you want to address different diseases that are currently addressable with Cas9, but also if you consider multiplexing, where you do the combination with different guide RNAs, and you want to cut at different sites, right? different targets at the same time. Yesterday, we had this panel about delivery, and we're discussing could you do multiple edits, like when you have a disease that is not only one single gene defect, but multiple, then you could do that potentially in one shot, right, if you add multiple guides, but always use the same CRISPR system. We haven't disclosed much data, um, but I have this one slide here just to show you that these systems are very much equivalent in our hands to Cas9. And you see this is from T-cell editing, very common targets. On the left side, single edit, and you see um, very good results here. And then on the right side, we're just showing a, a triplex edit, so three edits at the same time. And also that is very similar to what we can do with Cas9 and gives very good results. And this is not much optimized. And I will say all these systems that you've seen here, those are not protein engineered. So they are the natural systems that we discovered. The protein engineering can be done on top to further optimize in principle. So we're working on building our internal pipeline. We haven't disclosed that yet. Hopefully we will do that next year but also on partnerships to really complement what we're doing and to get acceleration to reach the patients, as this is for sure our major goal. And so we are working right now on some partnerships, and hopefully these will be announced soon, where you will see these are areas where the partners already have a lot of expertise, and they will, with that, hopefully help us accelerate getting these into patients and to validation. But we're also working on our internal proof of concepts on various targets and are building an internal pipeline that will be focused on in vivo um, approaches where there's high medical need. Um, what we don't want to do is just repeat what is out there already. So in principle, as you might have seen um, the T-cell data, we could repeat what other companies are already doing, but that's, a, in my view, too late, and it doesn't add much value to the patients, right? So we really want to move it to the next level. So in a grand scheme, think about what if you could do all that in vivo in the future, right, instead of having these ex vivo approaches. And that's part of the strategy as well. So. This is my final slide. I hope I have showed you that uh, the company is really getting ready to execute on, on these excellent discoveries um, originating out of Jennifer Downer's lab. And really, I think the, the less known part um, is that we are also now investing heavily into the therapeutics arm. I mean, it was considered initially as a diagnostics company, but these go now in parallel. And actually, there's a lot of synergies as well you could think of, but it's, it's also at the same time very different, right? I mean, in the technologies, it adds a lot of advantages to the company. For example, that the, the, the development of diagnostics is usually much faster than for therapeutics, right? So the company could be coming commercial much earlier than if it would just be a a therapeutics company, at the same time, the value creation of therapeutics for sure is much higher than in the diagnostic space. And yeah, with that, I thank you for your attention. <clears throat>